Okay, you might ask a very simple question. What's the historic history of technology ever done for you? That's essentially what I'm hoping to answer with some entertaining stories in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Because I'm from the Newcomen Society, which is the International Society for the History of Engineering and Technology. And I hope to persuade you that it's informative, that it's useful, and it's also extraordinarily interesting because from where you sit here today, you can trace the, the history back. Okay, if this... Uh, No? no? Page down. <coughs> it really doesn't want to go, does it? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, have we got an engineer present, please? <laughs> <coughs> oh, there's a puzzle. It worked before. Did it? Yeah, go on. Has he got to go onto one of these? Oh, that's my chair. Excellent. There is an engineer present. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm. Um, it's gone back again now. That's down. Okay, thank you very much for waiting. My first love is actually rolling mill design. This cartoon comes from the archives at Shotton. It's an, a, a rather jokey attempt to illustrate the construction of a new rolling mill there that was commissioned just as war broke out in 1939. And I hope to show you that there's a great deal of humour in the history of, uh, uh, a history of engineering and technology as well as... Um, um, Okay. Right, so what does the Newcomen Society do? Um, what's, what's our activities? Very briefly, we hold meetings around the country. There are branches uh, uh, in uh, a very lively branch here in Manchester, but wherever you move to work, there are meetings in uh, Bristol, Portsmouth, Edinburgh, um, uh, uh, London, uh, and, and, and Birmingham around the country for you to attend. We have study tours, the next one is to Dublin and uh, uh, it does include a brewery as it happens. We have a lively series of workshops, the most recent one was on the impact of the First World War on technology and what it did to post-war British industry in areas like chemical engineering, in areas like uh, mechanical engineering. We run a series of conferences and uh, publish a, a rather worthy academic journal, the International Journal for the History of Engineering and Technology, and a much more entertaining uh, quarterly newsletter. So there's a hell of a lot happening, um, and as I hope to indicate. Okay, so why should we be interested in the history of engineering as a discipline? Well, one, our slogan is actually learning from the past to inform the future. And what you very rapidly uh, appreciate as you get involved in the history of technology is the sheer continuity of themes. That, um, that it, uh, a ferrite core memory from a Ferranti Argus computer built here in Manchester is actually just a straightforward predecessor of the kind of fabs of which are diced into chips that Intel produce today. So we, we can learn where we come from and we can learn from the past and above all, I hope it's, as I'll illustrate to you, I hope it's going to be good fun. Just to plug for some forthcoming conferences, there's one coming up later this year on the anniversary of the Transatlantic Telegraph, in which Manchester was very heavily involved, incidentally, through a company called Telcom and a, and a local entrepreneur. And, of course, this first successful transatlantic telegraph was laid by the Great Eastern, which you see uh, being built here at the Isle of Dogs. Um, we meet regularly in Manchester. 
on the last, usually on the last Tuesday of the month, and one key feature of the meetings is extraordinarily lively discussion. And what I'd like to do is to bring, the point being that it's a bit like the meeting today. The expertise of the audience usually far exceeds the expertise of the speaker. So what I'd like to do today is to give a plug for the next two sessions in case you fancy coming along. Um, Professor Perrick is going to talk on the rather extraordinary story of uh, Mr. Ford and Mr. Morton. Mr. Morton is, is, is uh, of course, uh, Mr. Ford is, of course, Henry Ford, who became very affluent and rich in the 1920s and had something of an obsession with steam as a result of his early career working in a power plant. He then commissioned Herbert Morton of the local Ford Model T Works in Trafford Park to go round and buy up historical steam engines around the UK. So in 1929, Herbert Morton set off with a $10 million budget to buy up British historic artefacts and shipped no less than 28 <coughs> engines and boilers off to uh, Ford's museum, uh, emerging museum at Dearborn. He also, he wasn't that discriminating, he also shipped off things like a Cotswold cottage intact. So he basically stripped England, including Manchester, this is Fairbottom's Bob's in Manchester, an early Newcomen engine, stripped, um, uh, stripped Manchester of its artifacts, or stripped Britain of its artifacts in order to build up his collection. You may wonder why I've got some props. This is a... Uh, uh, a Bakelite clock with a rather modern plug on it, it hasn't even got round pins, about 70 years old. There were plastics in the past, and that's the subject of the next lecture after that, which is um, uh, Susan Mossman from the Science Museum, she's a material science specialist, talking about the development of early plastics, in, in particular in the UK, uh, from Parkinson to Bakelite. And this is just a sample of some of the uh, uh, Victorian products that were made uh, from early plastics. And of course, she'll doubtless bring the story up to date and talk about carbon fibres and composites. These meetings can be very lively. We had Dr Guy Anderson of Anderson Nuclear Power Consultants raising the very controversial issue as to whether Britain should actually have stuck with advanced gas-cooled reactors. After the Second World War, there was an imperative to make manufacture uh, plutonium, as I'll explain in a moment, and that led us to choose uh, 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 gas graphite technology. Uh, initially, shockingly, it was air-cooled, but then uh, with carbon dioxide, with magnox reactors, and the lineal, the obvious logical successor to the Magnox reactors was to scale them up in about 1965 and develop <coughs> advanced gas-cooled reactors. In contrast to the American technology, um, uh, like water reactors, which had come as an inheritance from their uh, submarine program. This was seen to be a great British failure at the time, as in particular some of the early stations, like Dungeon SB, severely overran. He raised the controversial issue that actually we should have stuck with advanced gas cooled reactors, that the later ones built were very successful in terms of performance, that there was actually American documentation suggesting that they're far from them pursuing uh, water moderated reactors, that they should actually have switched to some kind of gas graphite technology and generally arguing that the, the British government went, Margaret Thatcher went in the wrong direction, uh, for instance, by building Sizewell B. That's gloriously controversial. It, the paper was given by someone who's a practicing nuclear engineer who knew the business inside out. It's the kind of debate that is almost magic to attend because you get this lively insight. Another superb presentation, which is actually available on YouTube, uh, relates to good old-fashioned satellite navigation technology. Why? Because to your surprise and mine, this is now 50 years old. You may think of satellite navigation as being a relatively recent development, but the Newcomen Society, because we're interested in the history of engineering and technology, thought it was overdue to actually look at what looks like a modern technology, but actually dates back to 
uh, low Earth orbit satellites launched to enable Polaris missiles to locate themselves with, with accuracy, uh, Polaris submarines to locate themselves um, uh, with accuracy around the globe. And from that developed, for example, the first uh, public system, the first experimental system developed by Rockwell from about 1974 onwards and launched in February 78, which led on to your modern GPS system which you have in your car. There's now an elaborate system and um, uh, Norman Bonner uh, explained in great detail uh, exactly how this had come to be developed. And very impressive it was too, you can see that on YouTube. Okay, well what's the history of technology got to give you by way of insight into your own particular uh, set of circumstances? What I'd like to do for the, perhaps the last 10 minutes is to discuss uh, my own recent research on a rather strange and arcane world which is innovation in, during the Cold War. Now naturally this is not the easiest subject to study because I've been studying the practical evolution of atomic weapons and the development of uh, the guidance system for the Bloodhound 2 missile here in Manchester. That was slightly easier. And this actually has quite a serious purpose. Apart from the sheer curiosity, it highlights perhaps three things that I wish to emphasise. Three take-home messages. The first one is, despite what the first speaker said, is the near irrelevance of science to engineering and the fact that it's actually the engineers that matter and quite often not the science. The science of the first atomic weapon is relatively simple. Your average sixth former could work it out. Turning that into a weapon system requires engineering of a very high order. Please don't get me going on the phenomenon that the steam engine developed for a couple of hundred years very successfully without knowledge of thermodynamics and improved its performance year on year. So I want you to get at the engineering behind these developments. The second point that I wish to make is that the, in particular the development uh, of, of weapon systems illustrates beautifully the fact that knowledge in engineering is essentially an evolutionary process. That the suck it and see leads on to problem solving, leads on to the development along a particular trajectory of a solution, and people grope towards solutions, often by trial and error, and one solution builds on another in the way of experience. So the second message, the first one, the engineering matters, the second one is that evolution is a key feature of these developments. The third message I want to come bring across is the importance of gossip and scandal in the engineering profession. Because looking at the Bloodhound guided missile, it was quite clear that the way it evolved was wrapped through so-called communities of practice. A small group of people at Withenshaw made an astonishing breakthrough converting, helping convert the world from analog to digital and they did so essentially because they were a tight-knit group and the, co the cohesion came from gossip and scandal. Okay, for the next few minutes I'll explain what we've got, where we've got to. Okay, this is Britain's first atomic bomb and I'm very grateful for the Ministry of Defence and the Freedom of Information Act for releasing this photograph. You may not think this looks particularly distinguished and not particularly big, but I would draw your attention to the door frame in this building at Aldermaston and look at the size of the door frame and compare that to the size of the weapon. To put it bluntly, it was bloody enormous. And all the V-bomber force, the four V-bombers that were developed, the Sperring, Victor, Valiant and Vulcan, uh, were developed, were built essentially as medium bombers around this enormous weapon. So that was Britain's attempt, after we'd been cut off from American know-how, Britain's attempt to develop its first nuclear deterrent. And what I wanted to do was quite simply find out 
how it was made in practice. Now you could say, well weren't there stories about this? Answer, no. There were polite accounts of how scientists conceived the thing. These were doubtless carried out by interviews over at Cambridge High Table in the evening. But they said absolutely nothing whatsoever about the practical engineering of this uh, disruptive breakthrough weapon. You may dislike them, you may have a complete distaste for nuclear weapons, but it is an interesting question as to how they actually physically get developed. Of course, it's very much a contemporary question with, because we're concerned about uh, developments elsewhere in the world, but I wanted to answer the question, how do you actually build a nuclear weapon? How is it built in practice rather than the polite accounts that appear in the history books of the science? And this can be quite surprising for all sorts of reasons. <clears throat> for example, the drawings turned up. They turned up misfiled in, a, in a, uh, the RAF Museum at Hendon. They shouldn't have been in this file. It says top secret guard on there. So I naively went along to see the curator and said, innocently, do you think I could have a photocopy of this drawing? It's a nuclear weapon, remember? Okay. So he sucked through his teeth. It's going to be very difficult. So I waited. That's going to be extremely difficult, he said. And he was clearly anxious. I'm going to have to charge you a pound for the photocopy because it's going to extend over two sheets and it's 50p a sheet. Okay, the other striking feature, and this is why the history of technology is so fascinating, this was designed by a woman. Mrs. Adams signed it off. That's not the official story, it's actually signed off by a man. But when I conducted the oral history interviews, the person who sought took one look at the drawing and said, he never designed anything in his life. He just signed off the drawings. It was Mrs. Adams who designed it, and sure enough, her name is there on the drawing, but there's a tracer. But she actually did the design work. So this is one of the great things about studying the history of technology and using oral history. I was set out to find the initial designers and the people who built the nuclear weapon. On the face of it, this detective story is a waste of time. Everyone will tell you you cannot find out how nuclear weapons are designed. But it's surprising how many artefacts survive, for instance. This is the observation tower at Orford Ness, which you can go and visit if you uh, uh, because it's now, bizarrely, a National Trust property. They had Vinton cameras and Kinnis theodolites on top of this tower to watch, for instance, the ballistics of the bomb dropping from 40,000 feet and to monitor in an adjacent tower. They monitored using um, uh, telemetry. They monitored the relays working inside the weapon uh, uh, as it descended. And some very strange things turn up if you interview. I actually interviewed many of the people uh, in this photograph. One of the remarkable features of atomic weapons designers is that despite being exposed to explosions, they seem to have remarkable longevity. There is a very odd feature about this photograph, and I don't mean the fact that um, people like Reg Milne and Peter Parker and uh, John Allen are in this photograph. All the leading designers are there. This is a secret compound at Farnborough set up to do the practical engineering on Britain's first nuclear weapon. ARL, as it was euphemistically called, Airfield Radio Laboratory. ARL was one of the most secret places in the world when this photo was taken in 1952. It also illustrates that engineers have a brilliant sense of humour. You may have already spotted something incongruous between the second and the back row, a man with a turnip head and a hat on, a Russian spy called Ivan, who was put there by Peter Barker as a joke. Even in his 90s, he retains a brilliant sense of humour. This is the most secret place in the world. These people are doing top-secret atomic work. There are armed guards in that photograph who you didn't mess with. 
nevertheless, there's a Russian spy in the photograph. Okay, he was put there, he collected some clothes. This became the official photograph of Sid Hunwicks, who was in charge, sitting in the middle of the picture. Sid Hunwicks, who was in charge, um, uh, decreed that this was the one where everyone was smiling because the people in the back row uh, were in on the joke. Okay. You think engineering is a sensible, ordered thing to do with finite element analysis, drawings and calculations. This is the inner explosive sphere of Blue Danube. Uh, it, the size of it dictated the enormous size of the bomb. And this is a, 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 a prototype model in a shed at ARL in Farnborough. Uh, the young Reg Milne is the chap there with the short hair. This was the explosive sphere which imploded in order to compress the um, plutonium to reduce the, release the heat. The explosives had to be cushioned. And as you can see, there's a set of aluminium outer plates there, 32 of them connected together with piano wire, hinged together with piano wire. The set of aluminium plates around the sphere with uh, the 32 uh, uh, detonators uh, in, the, uh, in the apertures. This had to be cushioned so that it withstood the vibration of takeoff and landing in the aircraft. It withstood the vibration of handling. Where do you go to to get cushioning? They decided the best way to cushion it was airbags. 32 of them, one for each plate, one for each section of explosives as it happened. It tessellates like a soccer ball. Where do you go to get airbags? These were uh, pumped up incidentally to about 55 pounds per square inch uh, and they went off to the local bicycle suppliers to get the Schrader valves. Well, the answer is, of course, you go to a hot water bottle manufacturer in Barnsley whose main product is Super Seal hot water bottles. Those of us of a more mature age went to bed with these as children. But Reg Mill searched for uh, someone to make the rubber airbags and there at the Super Seal works was the ideal solution. So on the same production line that made Super Seal hot water bottles, they were making the vital components for Britain's first nuclear deterrent. That's how engineers solve problems. Okay, forget your finite element analysis, it's off to the local hot water bottle manufacturer. Okay, the reason that I was willing to, or keen to find out about how they solve the problems of developing an atomic bomb in the absence of uh, knowledge, for instance, from the Americans. That actually grew our interest developed or developed alongside another study that I'd done trying to look at how engineering really worked in the case of the Bloodhound guided missile, which was largely developed here at Withenshaw in the Ferranti Automation Department. Another euphemism, of course, another piece of dissembling. And I wrote the paper on this, published it. And no sooner had I published it than someone rang up from the Swiss Air Force. And the Swiss Air Force said to me, well now you know all about it, you might as well come and see one. And invited me over for a day out at an Air Force base in Switzerland, Zug, and opened this um, uh, Cold War silo. They had a massive key to open this silo, which was about, to, yeah, you know, about six feet long. And this was a bla atomic bar blast proof door, and they opened the door, swung it aside, and said, Help yourself. And there inside was a section of Bloodhound Mark II, and in another perfectly preserved, in an, in an adjacent air conditioned silo, was the computer that I'd come to study. So that just goes to show you do sometimes get breakthroughs, but unfortunately, you often don't get the breakthrough until you've done all the hard work. <coughs> But this is interesting for another reason. This too had evolved. This is an evolutionary story here of problem solving and sucking the sea. But this was extraordinarily interesting because of the guidance system. The guidance system which was developed and invented in Manchester by Maurice Gribble. Uh, he uh, designed and developed the Argus 200 as it became the uh, uh, 
uh, Arcus tr uh, computer. There's by no means enough time, because I'm running out of time, aren't I? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, he developed the Argus computer, and this too was one of those gobsmacking stories. He sat in his home in Abergavenny, with his feet up on the table in, the, uh, in this lovely chair which his parents had designed, because they used to supply liberties with furniture. And, and he sat in this chair, and he said, well, I thought, and this is going back to 1954, he said, well, it was interesting. He said, I thought I'd go out and design a computer. Right? Just like you do. That's what engineers do. He said, I thought I'd go out and design a computer. And he said, I thought valves were much too slow. Uh, so I thought I'd use these new hearing aid transistors. And he literally went out on his own at Ferranti, uh, where he had a job at the Withenshaw and designed this hearing aid transistor computer, which led on and on and on uh, through to uh, this Argus computer. Now this Argus computer was extraordinarily interesting for a number of reasons. It is because it was at the hinge of history. This is where the world began to go digital. You take digital for granted. You assume that everything is digital. Your mobile phone is digital. We've heard cars are going digital. Aircraft are digital. But that wasn't the case in the mid-1950s. The world was an analog world. We relied not on noughts and ones. We relied on continuous signals. Continuous signals, incidentally, that weren't particularly stable and would tend to drift. Okay? So what happened? They were developing, on the one hand, there's Morris Gribble playing around nicely with computers. On the other hand, they're trying to develop a guided missile for the, for the RAF to shoot down incoming uh, bombers carrying these same atomic weapons. How come the Bloodhound guided missile switched to digital control? And herein lies the nature of engineering, the nature of this meeting. It's because of friendship. As the person who took the decision to switch it to digital, Derek Whitehead, said, I knew Morris was developing this gizmo, so I went along to chat to him, and it seemed to me that we couldn't solve the problems of developing a guided missile using analogue techniques. It wasn't accurate enough, it wasn't fast enough, so I thought we'd adopt Morris's Grismo and stuff it onto the Bloodhound guided missile. That's engineering. Social acquaintance making a dramatic leap in technology. Just as a result of social interaction, they decided they can make this dramatic leap in technology. You can read the paper and find out all the obstacles they faced. You can go and read the paper uh, and, and find out uh, how it was that, for instance, the radar research establishment said, nothing will ever be digital in the Ministry of Defence. All right? Kind of encouraging, isn't it? Right. OK. So what we have then is two observations developing here. One is that things are developed very much by suck it and see. And secondly, what matters is how engineers interact and share ideas, how they network, as we heard with the young rail engineers. But this had major and profound implications, because actually the digital computer was being developed for civilian use, for process control. Because if you think about it, the setup of the radar dish on a light guided missile is actually identical to the problem of setting up uh, the roll gap and the roll speed and the roll position on a rolling mill, which was a kind of other problem they were dealing with. And what you may find incredible, if you've ever been to Fleetwood in Lancashire, which is a former fishing port and seaside resort just up the coast from Blackpool, about as sleepy as it gets, is that by 1963, Fleetwood was the world centre of computing. It was the pioneer location for the first applications of online direct digital control for a chemical plant. 
So here we have sleepy Lancashire, an ICI obsolete soda ash factory leading the world in terms of process control uh, out of Manchester. As I say, it's a remarkable story when you start to unpick and unfold what was going on uh, during the Cold War. Okay, I hope I managed to persuade you that you can get insights from the history of technology that actually it will show you the unsung story of engineers. And if I can just finish on one last point. In order to get the information on the development of the Britain's first atomic bomb, I relied on oral history interviews. This meant travelling the length and breadth of Britain and going to see these elderly engineers and designers in their houses. It became almost a cliché that as I walked to the door, they would say to me, I thought I would take these secrets to the grave. They all thought that as engineers, their role in developing this uh, remarkable uh, weapon would never ever get recorded or recognised. Of course they've been silenced by the Efficient Secrets Act. This was top secret atomic, you couldn't ever talk about it. But now, here am I in the 90s encouraging to break the Official Secrets Act by telling me all they know about the engineering, because otherwise the story of the engineering uh, will pass unrecorded. Thank you very much. We've run out of time, have we? Yeah, yeah, we've run out of time.